All right, now what we see in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 are uh, these messages to the various churches. These are real churches, seven churches during, during this time period where John is writing unto them. And they're messages from God unto these churches, you know, various things that they're doing well and they need work on that, that um, need to be taken care of and, and they're being written to literally by the word of God. Now, I love these verses, these chapters, because... God's word is timeless, and God's word still applies to churches today. We get a lot of wisdom from this and a lot of instruction on how we ought to be as a church by looking at all of these examples, and oftentimes we need the bad examples that we could learn from to make sure, hey, we don't want to be like this, because it's, it, it's a lot easier to identify usually when things are going wrong than even when everything's going right. Sometimes it's harder to make sure that everything's right unless you know what's wrong. Unless you know, hey, this is a problem. This is, you, know, you, you can't be like this. right? And, and, and those, these are really good indicators to say, whoa, if we're, if we're starting to catch ourselves or find ourselves behaving or looking like or whatever like this, and it's something that's, that's marked as, as not a good trait, not a good quality, something that God's saying, hey, you need to repent. You need to get this right. Then it's a good indicator for us to say, okay, well, we need to... Um, he take heed to this and learn from this and, and move forward. So um, how does God, and, and, and what I'm pausing this morning is, how do you think, and just take a second to, to reflect on this, how do you think that God would write unto our church? Now, I realize we're a small church. These were probably all really big churches. They had a lot more things going on or whatever. We may be a small church, but we're still a church. Nonetheless, we're, we're a gathering of, of local believers. We're assembling together, and, and we are a church that is supposed to be doing God's work. And um, just try to think honestly about it, or critically, if you will. Oftentimes, we make the mistake of getting really comfortable and thinking that everything's great when it's really not that great. And we want to make sure that, that you know, we can analyze even ourselves according to God's standard and, and just take a think about it. Now, how did God judge these various churches. What did he say? Well, if you, when you read chapters 2 and 3, you'll find over and over and over again, he says, I know thy works. I know your works. That is what God's looking at when he's judging the churches. Because see, we know that salvation comes only by faith, right? It has nothing to do with our works. But if you had a bunch of people who are unbelievers, you don't even have a church, a legitimate church, because this is who he's talking to. These are legitimate churches in God's eyes. These are churches, they have got a candlestick, and God's dealing with these churches, and he has messages for these churches to do. And there's a whole spectrum of, of churches in these two chapters, from churches that are pretty good, that only need you know, a little fine-tuning maybe here and there because they're doing a lot of good things, to churches that have almost nothing good, and they seem to probably be filled with a bunch of unbelievers, but there's still enough there to call it a church. And you say, you need to really get things right and shape up, otherwise I'm just removing your candlestick. And we need to constantly be in a, in a, in a place of just self-evaluation, right? It's good to just go back to this and say, you know, our, would, would God, if God were to look at us and write a letter to our church, what would he say? What would, what would it be? How would we be judged? Look at verse 14 here in chapter 3. We're going to look at the church of Laodicea. Laodicea is not a good example of a church. Now, I'm not saying that our church is just like Laodicean church, because I don't believe that. But there's some very good principles and points that I want to gain, glean from this and, and learn from this and hopefully apply to our church in areas where we may be lacking. Look at verse number 14. The Bible says, And under the, church, under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou wert cold or hot, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now, what God's saying here, the message he's giving is, you know, this is a church that's, they've, they've got some good things going on because, you know, what's lukewarm? Well, cold, what would, you know, cold and hot. If you're cold, you're not doing anything, right? You're cold, you're just out of it, you're, you're completely on that polar opposite. If you're hot, man, you're on fire, you're doing this, you're doing that, you know, you've got a lot of activity, you've got a lot of work, you're very fervent in spirit, you've got all kinds of things going on. Lukewarm is what? Just middle of the road. Lukewarm's just, eh. 
I'm not cold. I'm not just completely out in the world and just doing nothing. And I'm not, but I'm not on fire. We're just kind of getting by. And the way that God describes lukewarm is I want to spew you out of my mouth. This, it's funny because this came up yesterday at the church picnic when <laughs> Mrs. Segletis was talking about the, the getting shrimp, right? And the, and the shrimp it was, it was room temperature, right? When you get cocktail shrimp, it's supposed to be cold. Usually they serve it on ice. It's like, and that's how you enjoy it. When you get other food, you expect it to be hot, right? You want your, your food served to you hot. You say, oh man, this is good. But when it just sits around for a long time and it's just room temperature, that doesn't give you a, a very much satisfaction, right? And that's the, the, the imagery that God's using here. Like, I want you either cold or hot, but because you're just lukewarm, because you're just middle of the road, because you're not really getting anything done, your spirit's not in it, I want to spew you out of my mouth. We have a tendency to think that, well, I mean, not just in the world, like I'm getting some things done, so I'm pretty good, and, and you're okay with that. This is the perspective from God saying, no, that's not good enough. Amen. If I'm going to judge you on your works, and I want you to be hot, I want you on fire. And if you're just going to be lukewarm, you might as well just get out of the fight then. You might as well just, just forget about it. Because I don't want lukewarm. I don't want this, this impression being, you know, of people just being, oh, is that what Christianity is? It's just this lukewarmness? That's not what God wants. He wants you to be on fire. He wants you doing what you can do. He wants you to have zeal. That's why he follows up here in verse 17. He says, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Basically, these people are, hey, everything's going great. I've got money financially. Hey, everything's just fine. I don't have any problems. We're, we're going along good. And typically, when things are going really well in your life, you have a tendency just to think everything's great. And this is specifically talking about just financially, right? And, it, and this is the easiest way to slip out of God's will, if you, you know, so to speak, is just everything's going well financially in your life. You don't really have any pressure. You don't really have any, any reason to be seeking God or to make sure you're in God's will. Just everything seems to be going really well. We're good, man. All right. We got, I go to church once a week. Everything's going great. So God must be happy with me because everything's going so well in my life. And that is the wrong attitude to have because he says here, you know, hey, I'm rich, increased with goods, I've needed nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. The way that God views things, the lens or the, the, the vision that he has on your life, has nothing to do with how much money you have. It has nothing to do with how comfortable you are and how many cars you have and how big your house or anything like that. That could be our view sometimes. Hey, everything's great because financially everything is good. But when God views you, he's looking at your spirit. He looks through to your soul. And he says, you think you're all great because you have this stuff, but I'm looking at your soul and you know what? You're wretched, miserable, poor, but you don't even realize it. You don't even realize the condition that you're in because you think everything's going so well. He says in verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that thy, the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. And then he says in verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Now, thank God that God loves us. Thank God that there is his word here to provide the rebuke that we need from time to time. And, and the last thing we want to have is a spirit that says, oh man, I'm offended. Oh, I can't believe you're preaching this sermon. Oh, are you preaching a sermon just to me? You know, and get all mad and leave when, you know, even me personally, I love you. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't be preaching sermons to try to motivate you, try to get you stirred up and to show you how God thinks about being lukewarm. This is, and look, these are not my words. God's the one saying, I want to spew you out of my mouth if you're lukewarm. I'm not calling out individuals by name and saying, you're lukewarm, you're hot, you're cold. That's not, that's not my business. I'm presenting God's word for you to apply that to yourself. And I'm also preaching this because this is something that was preached unto a church. So now I'm relaying these same messages to our church because quite honestly, I'm a little concerned with our church 
and I'm worried about a spirit of the state of our church. Now, don't get me wrong. I thank God we have a great church family. I love this church. I love everyone in this church and everyone that's here, especially this morning, everyone here I consider a personal friend of mine. And I know that if I have anything that I need, you'll be there for me. And if you have anything that you need, I'm there for you. No matter what. And, and we have a great family in that sense. And I love it. And this is a close church. And I am so thankful for that. People here honestly care for one another. They pray for one another. They visit one another. And that is lacking in many churches. Believe me. This is great. I love it. However, I'm still concerned about the, cheer, the, the spirit of our, of our church this morning. It, it's a concern of mine, and that's why I think we need to maybe hit the reset button, get back through here, look at the Word of God, and, and see where we may be lacking. I'm concerned about a spirit of laziness. I'm concerned about a spirit of backsliding and overall downplaying of the importance of God's work getting done. That's my concern. And whatever spirit a church has tends to be infectious. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 20. Deuteronomy chapter number 20. Because especially when it comes to a church, now there's many areas in our lives, many areas where we need to make sure that we're right with God. All kinds of things that we ought to hold as having a personal responsibility, right? I mean, in your prayer time, in your Bible reading time, and you know, in whatever it is, all these things that you personally have your own personal walk with God in your own private life. But the things that happen within the church have much more of an impact on other people than the things that you do privately in your own life. And we're going to get into that in just a minute, but first I want to show, or just point out here in, in Deuteronomy 20, there's a principle here of how infectious spirit, a spirit can be in, in your, you know, your will, your, you, the, what you... Um, the way that you are, your spirit, your soul, you know, comes forward and, and has an impact on other people. Now, in Deuteronomy 20, we see these commands and how the children of Israel were to deal with when they go to war and who should be going out to fight and who should be staying home. And there you have the cold or hot, right? If you're hot, you're going to fight. You're going to be in that battle. You're cold, you're staying home. Amen. And what they do here we're going to see is they're getting rid of the lukewarm that they've they've showed up to fight but they're really lukewarm and are going to do damage to the overall group of good that, that's going to try to fight a specific battle look at verse number one the bible says when thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou be not afraid of them for the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Now, the spiritual battle that we have to fight today, it's an uphill battle. There are so many more enemies than people that are on our side fighting for this cause. It's just a fact. There's, there, there's so much of an uphill battle. We've got the world against us, the culture against us, you know, Satan against us. There's so many things against us. I mean, but praise God, if God be for us, who could be against us, right? I mean, we know that we could be assured of victory. We know that what we're doing is not in vain. And we know that ultimately, if we have our faith in the Lord, we can't be defeated. But you have to have the faith. Because just looking at it, it doesn't look good. The odds aren't in our favor. There's a whole multitude against us. And this is the warning now he's giving in a physical battle. You go out to battle and you see a great multitude of people and there's a people more than you, that's not good odds. It looks like you're going to fail, right? He says, don't be afraid of them because God's with you. The same God that brought you out of the land of Egypt when you were slaves, he's with you. Verse number two, and it shall be when ye are come nigh unto the battle that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people and shall say unto them, hear, O Israel, Ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint. Fear not and do not tremble, neither be ye terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. And the officers shall speak unto the people, saying, What man is there that hath built a new house and hath not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man dedicate it. And what man is he that hath planted a vineyard and hath not yet eaten of it? Let him also go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle and another man eat of it. 
And what man is there that hath betrothed the wife and hath not taken her? Let him go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle and another man take her. And the officers shall speak further unto the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return unto his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. So basically what he's saying here, you know, hey, you got all these other things on your mind. You got your concerns out at home, out in the world, and not on the battle. Go home. Take care of your stuff then. If that's where your mind's going to be at, if you're worried about your vineyard, you're worried about your wife, you're worried about all those other things, oh, I haven't done this, then you're not going to be effective in the battle. And if you're just going to be afraid, go home because we don't want your fear spreading to everybody else here that's supposed to be strong and have a good courage and willing to fight. This is the, the advice that he gives. And it says in verse 9, and it shall be when the officers have made an end of speaking unto the people that they shall make captains of the armies to lead the people. So once they finally got rid of everybody that, that needs to go because they're lukewarm, I mean, they showed up, right? But their heart's not in it. Their spirit's not in it. And it's just going to affect and infect the rest of the people there. The fear is going to spread. And this is the way, you know, this is the principle that also can apply within a church. We're a group of people. We have a spiritual battle, if you will, right? Now, this is also a place to grow. It's not, it's not a perfect illustration of the church because there's going to be people here of all different spiritual growth and level. Not everyone's ready to go to the war, let's face it. You need to continue to grow and, and to get to the place where you're strong enough to get into that fight. So the, the, you know, our church is a little bit more multifaceted than just one battle. Okay, I just want to make that distinction. So I'm not saying just don't come to church if you're not ready to fight every single battle. Because this is also a training ground. There's also other things going on here. But what I do want to say is we need to be careful of the spirit, you know, like the spirit of fear that can have an impact on everybody else. And especially when you come to a place where you know, God wants us to be zealous. God wants to say, be zealous, therefore, and repent of the lukewarmness. He wants us to be on fire because once we start allowing other things to just take priority in our life and, you know, hey, we're here to support one another and fellowship with one another. Uh, turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 10. This will explain perfectly where I'm going with this. And we have such a good family mentality here, which is, which is awesome. But we also influence one another then, whether it be for good or bad. Positive and negative, we're going to have an influence on those around us. And we want to make sure that our spirit, that we have this zeal um, about us to help influence people to do more, to help encourage and to build up, to do even more for the Lord. Look at 2 Corinthians. Well, I'll read this for you. I have you turning to Hebrews 10. Stay in Hebrews 10. 2 Corinthians 9, verse number 1, the Bible says, For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you, for I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. Being a zealous church, having people who are on fire for the Lord is a great thing. Why? Because it's going to provoke many people. And what he's writing here in 2 Corinthians 9 was he's talking about them ministering to the saints, helping out other people in need, helping out other believers. He's all, you know, financially and otherwise, just, just being a help. He says, you guys have done a great job with that. It's superfluous for me to even write unto you because you're doing such a good job with this. And he says, I know the forwardness of your mind, of your mind and how you help you know, Macedonia and Achaia. He says, your zeal has provoked very many. Other people see that. Other people see the zeal. Other people see the works. And that, light, that, that gets a fire under their butt. Say, oh man, look at how great this church is doing. And it rubs off on them. The spirit can then can continue and grow and, be, and people get edified. Like, oh man, look at what they're doing. Why can't we do that too? We ought to be doing that. Look at how good they are at this, at ministering to the saints. We need to be doing that too. And it provokes many, but there has to be a zeal there. If, 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 a church, if you go to a church and it's just kind of dead and no one's doing anything, is that going to provoke you to, to do good works? No, of course not. Why would it? I mean, at the most, maybe if, if you're already on fire, it might provoke you to say, we got to get things going and try to, and try to, to stir people up at best. But if you're not already stirred up, if you, and, and even if you are, and you just start, you know, you join yourself to a church that's just kind of dead and not really doing anything and has no zeal, 
It's a lot more likely that you're going to become like everybody else than you're going to get everyone else on fire and zealous for the Lord. I mean, that's just the way that it works. It, you know, you could like it or not, but that's just the way things are. It's just, it's, it's, you know, it, and it's very few that are able to maintain a good zeal without having the encouragement of everyone else. I mean, that's why people are moving across country to go to, to various churches that are doing a lot for the Lord. It's because they want to be a part of that, because they know how hard it is to be going to a church where nobody's on fire, nobody's serving the Lord, no one's really doing anything. And you have the, the desire in your heart to say, you know, I want to be a part of this. 2 Timothy, or excuse me, not 2 Timothy, Titus chapter 2, verse 14. Say in Hebrews 10, we're going there in just a minute. Titus 2, 14 says, in, in regards to Jesus, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. God wants us to be zealous. He wants us to be hot. He wants us to be on fire. He doesn't want us to be lukewarm. And we ought to be zealous of good works. And that's why I briefly mentioned after the announcements this morning, you know, talking about the gospel rescue mission and, and things that we do, you know, we ought to be zealous and wanting to do the good works, wanting to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and wanting to do those good things and those good works and being zealous towards them as opposed to having the, the mindset and mentality of, oh, I just got to do this work. And, you know, Word of Truth Baptist Church is just always... Put, trying to put me to work and go soul winning and, and, and be part of these ministries and do this, you know, it's just too much work. I can't handle this right now. You know, that, is a, that is a poor spirit. Instead of being thankful that God has given you the opportunity and, and considers you important to go out and do this work for him. Because let's face it, you know, the work that I have that I want everyone to be a part of in this church, it's not work for me. I'm not benefiting any bit from you going off and winning souls to Christ or do, you know, being part of these ministries. It's not for me. It's for God. Amen. So first of all, don't think ever that it's because of me. It's not. And we ought to be zealous to serve the Lord and do what he has for us to do and get the right mindset. How can I serve God better? What, what do you have for me to do, Lord? Instead of, you want me to do that? The difference between the Spirit will rub off on other people because, like I said, we come together, we fellowship, and however your attitude's going to be towards serving God, it's going to rub off on other people. Now, let's think of some real basic work because God's judging churches based on works, right? And I've got two works that I'm just going to be focusing on because they are the most um, influential on those around us within the church because I'm dealing with the church as a body, not just the individual. The individuality, you have so many things that, that in your service to God, like I said, that's going to affect you or you and your family, but not necessarily the entire church. The entire church, there's two things that I came up with that I kind of want to touch on this morning and works that we ought to be zealous for. And the first one just being, how about just attending church? How about just showing up when the doors are open? And I like the motto that's, that's put, been put forth out by other Baptists, three to thrive. You know, we have three church services. We don't have seven church services. Or not, we don't have church like twice a day, although I wouldn't be against any of that. I think that's great. I think the more is better. But we're offering three church services, times where we can all gather together in one place. We could praise God and honor God and sing songs to God in the midst of the congregation. We can praise Him as well as edifying one another seeing how everybody's doing, encouraging one another, as well as hearing from his word be taught, only three times a week. Now, if you're in Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse number 24. Because church attendance is definitely going to help you individually, but it's one of those things where it's not just about you. Coming to church isn't just about you. And again, unfortunately, in churchianity out there, people have this mentality of, what can this church do for me? Right. And that is the wrong mindset. That is not what church is about at all. It's not just what can church do for you. Now, you do receive a lot of benefits from coming to church. But that is not the mindset to have in a healthy church, in a zealous church, in a church that wants to love God and serve Him. Because the mind of Christ is a minister to serve other people. 
It's not about yourself. It's about everybody else. And that is one of the best benefits of going to church is where you can actually do something for somebody else. Look at verse number 24. Uh, the Bible says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And look at this. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. What day do you think it's talking about? When you see the day approaching. The day of Christ. You see the, the, the end times coming. We see that day approaching when Christ is finally going to return. So much the more is it necessary to be gathering together and provoking one another to love and to good works and to be there and to strengthen each other because that is one of the primary things that we do in church. It's not just, the primary thing of church is not just the preaching. I, I wouldn't even say that that's the primary thing. Now it may take up a significant portion of time and it is very important, but the primary of church is literally to be there for each other and to provoke one another to love and the good works and to move forward as a body. And how can you do that if you're not in church? This is something you cannot do without being here. You're not going to be good at provoking one another into love and good works when you're not here. And every person in this church has a role. Everybody does. Everybody has something to offer. God has gifted every single one of you individually with your own talents and your own skills and your own abilities. And everybody here is very valuable to this church. Every single person. And when you're not here, you're missing from the body and the body suffers as a result. You may think, well, what am I? What, you know, what, does anyone really care? Yes, I do care. It, you know, and if no one else does, which I don't believe, Individually, whoever you are this morning, if you're not here, I care. I care about you. I hope that things are going well with you. And, 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 and I'm always just concerned about anybody who's not in church every single service. Because I care. And others feel the same way. We want to be a blessing to you. And, and you ought to be here to be a blessing to everyone else. And we're here in this together to provoke unto love and to good works. <clears throat> now one of the things that's easy to do is to use situations now and look you, you make up your own standard but like I said I like the three to thrive I think that's great I think we need church the more as we see the day approaching some people only go to church once a week once a month you know whatever that, that's ultimately between you and God you know, that, that's up to you to decide what's important. I know when I find, you know, when I grew up, personally, I grew up in a Presbyterian, going to a Presbyterian church, and we, they only had, like, one church service. So, I mean, we went to church Sunday morning, and that was it. And that's what I was used to, and that was the tradition, and that was what I did, and that was fine. But when I finally got, well, got saved, and then found a church that was a really good church, and I started growing and, and getting things out of my life, I'll tell you what, it didn't take very long, just for me personally, to make the decision that, wow, this is really important. I've been so messed up and backwards on so many things, I need to make sure I'm in this place as much as possible. And that was just a personal, you know, at the beginning was just for me. I had the selfish mentality. Hey, but I realized what church was doing for me. It's helping me to recognize all these various sins in my life. It's helping me to realize areas I need to improve on. And I had a thirst for the word of God. Now, every church service is different. You know, we have two services on Sunday. It's not just a repeat of morning sermon in the evening just so that we could accommodate those who can't make it in the morning. That's not what it's about. When you get something new delivered unto you, the work that I put into the Word of God to help you to, to, to give you what I'm seeing, what I believe is the truth from God's Word, every single service. I put hours and hours into these sermons for you. Why? Because I care about you. I don't treat this as some light thing or just flippantly and just, well, let's see what we're we going to learn today and just kind of wing it. 
No, I want to prepare a good meal from God's word for you to learn by and grow by and to help you out. And I think about the people in this church. I think about the problem. And it's why I'm preaching this sermon this morning, because I care about this church. I think about the things that we need to know here and we need to grow by here to present and to give you enough scripture to prove why I believe it's not just my opinion. This is what God says. But it's easy to, you know, already make a decision, you know, where I did. I made a decision, you know what? This is important for me. I want to make sure I'm in church. Just whenever the doors are open, man, I want to be there because I want to grow. I want to do more. And the more I came, the more you get to know other people in the church. And then the more you realize, hey, I want to help other people out. And you start to get the right heart and attitude. You know, we may start off selfish, but it shouldn't end selfish. You should be considering and understanding we need to be provoking one another unto love and good works. And then when you go through your hard times, if, you've got the right, if you're in a church that's got the right spirit that's considering one another, which I do believe this church has, is that a great spirit. I love that about our church. But that we're here to support you. And everybody goes through tough times. And it's different for everyone. But the last thing you want to do during a situation of trial and trouble is to let that get you out of church. Is to allow that to, to, to come into your life and then, and then keep you away from your support group, from the people that love you, from the people that want to provoke you into love and the good works. And unfortunately, it's, it's, it's this, this sinful, fleshly mindset that we have where sometimes when things go bad, you want to isolate yourself and distance yourselves from those that care about you the most and from those that want to help you out the most. And um, I, I, under, I, I can't say I completely understand it. I know that it exists, and I know that I've fallen into this as well, of to just not want to have anything to do with anybody. But think about this. We know that God wants us in church. We know that he doesn't want us to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. We see that in Scripture. But name to me one situation where getting away from God is a good idea. We're getting away from the house of God. Getting away from the people of God is a good idea. That that's going to be found in Scripture. Say, well, you know what? There's some times where you just have to get away from church. You just have to get away from God. You just have to get away from reading the Bible. You just have to get away from praying. Does anyone have any examples of that in Scripture? Because I haven't seen any. I find it quite the opposite. Is that when we go through our hard times, our trials, that is when we need to be closest to Jesus. That's when we need to be closest to God. That's when we need to be more making sure we're getting into and staying solid through our faith and through the people at church so that we can stand. Because when those, the, the, the storms come, I preached that sermon just a little while ago, a week or two ago on weathering storms. You know, when those storms come, we can withstand those storms because we've got the people around us to help. <clears throat> I know what it's like to go through bad times and even just be emotional or whatever, having a bad day or a bad week or you know, something's going on and you kind of just have a bad attitude because all things are going bad, right? And, and, but don't let that bad attitude say, well, Forget it, man. Forget church. Just, I'm just going to sit home and do nothing or whatever. Don't let that happen. Try not to let that attitude overtake you. Like I said, the last thing, and, and I've used this example before. I'll use it again because it's so true. And, and we all deal with things, and we all have points where we get fed up with things in general. And we, and we get kind of a rotten attitude. Look, I'll admit it. I get a rotten attitude sometimes. But I'll tell you what, every time I've had a rotten attitude... But I've, I've just pushed myself because I've already determined the importance of certain things in serving God. When I go out soul winning or when I come to church, every single time without fail, my attitude has always changed. Amen. No matter what the issue has been, there's always been a benefit from going out soul winning or coming to church, doing these things has always turned things around. Always. It's always been a blessing. Now, it doesn't change your outside circumstances from being real. But it helps you. Even for a short time, having that respite, getting that, that, that encouragement, helping other people out, it gives you a better perspective on your own life. When you lead a soul to Christ... Wow, do your own problems seem to kind of fade away? Because even if it's just for that moment, for those 10, 20, 30, 40 minutes, however long you're spending with someone giving the gospel, 
You're not thinking about yourself. You're not thinking about the problems that you have. You're concerned with somebody else going to heaven. And that's a priority, and that's important. And when you could lead someone else to Christ, you receive a joy even during some of your worst times. And you want to make sure that you don't miss out on that. When you miss church, when you miss out on soul, when you skip these things, you're missing out on the excitement also. Now, I think everyone in here would agree. Isn't it exciting when someone gets saved, they get baptized, they come to church? I mean, that's exciting. That's great to be a part of. Well, this month, we had that happen. Brother Sebastian won someone to the Lord, got them to come to church, got them to get baptized. Praise God, what an exciting event. But you know what? Almost everybody missed it. Almost everybody missed it in this church. You're missing out on the excitement when you're not here. And that excitement is what helps to keep us going. It helps motivate us. Man, I praise God, like that got me fired up. And I was like, awesome. Brother Sebastian comes back from soul winning. He's got someone with him. He's like, hey, Pastor Burton, can we set up the tub? Because I got someone, you know, someone wants to get baptized. Well, praise God, that's awesome. Let's do it, man. Let's, you know, <laughs> this, is, this is great. This is what it's all about. This is what we're trying to do. We're really trying to reach people. But the excitement fades when you're not here. It's just, it's, it just becomes a... Oh, look, we got a baptism in September. As opposed to being a part of it. And look, the excitement's important. It's going to help you. It helps motivate all of us. So we can have that right spirit and we can go together and, and continue to work and strive. This is, you know, we're seeing this fruit. We're seeing it come in. We're putting in the labor. And especially in many of the areas we go to, it's hard work. It's hard labor. We're struggling, man. It's, you know, we go days sometimes, you know, a full Sunday going out for like three hours and nobody ends up getting saved. That's hard work. And I know sometimes it could feel like it's discouraging, but all the more reason to make sure you're here when the excitement happens. Because it does happen, and it will happen, and people get saved regularly, but you have to be committed. You have to be in it and continue in it to, to receive of that, that blessing and that excitement. Uh, flip over, if you would, to... Uh, turn, if you would, to John 21. I'm going to read for you a, another um, letter unto one of the other churches in Revelation 2, going along the same line, because the other, besides coming to church and besides church attendance, I believe it's important to do the soul winning, to do the works, because we're looking at the works that are involved with a church that God would judge a church on. One, I think, is just being here. Are people come, you know, is it important enough for you to come to church and to congregate with everyone else and to be a blessing to everyone else and to learn and to sing songs and everything else just to be here? Is that important enough to you? But also getting involved in the work, in the ministering, in the things that we're doing to reach people. And the number one thing that we do is the soul winning. Now, the number two thing we're doing is that other mission where we're, we're also going out and trying to reach people that way. And we do other little things from time to time. We'll do activities. We'll do, uh, you know, put on like the, the movie event and stuff. We're trying to reach out to the community and bring truth to them. Those are good too. But the primary one, the most important one, is just bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost. Doing the soul winning. Revelation 2 verse 1. I'll read this for you. You're in John 21. Go ahead and stay there. Revelation 2, 1 says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars on his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. So this is a, a much better church than Laodicea. He's talking to the church of Ephesus saying, look, I know your work. I know you're putting in labor. I know you're doing things. I know your patience. I know that you're trying people. I know that you hate evil. I know that you know, you're, you're trying to discern between people who are of God and who are not, people who are saying they're apostles, and that you're doing a good job of, of calling them out and saying you're a false prophet. I see these things. This is what God's saying. Like, he's commending this church. You've got some good things going here. And then he says in verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, 
or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Now, you might have a different understanding of this verse, but what I think is somehow the first works, it's easy to get yourselves wrapped up in so many other things of even serving God, you know, laboring and doing a lot of work. You can fill your time doing a lot of work, but we need to maintain the first works, the primary works, the things that are the most important. We can do all kinds of programs here and all kinds of outreach and, and, and create or, you know, youth programs and bus programs and all these other things. And what can happen is that that can end up taking the focus of all of our time and leaving off the first works, which is literally just bringing the gospel. That's why I believe the first works are bringing the gospel to the lost. You'd have a hard time convincing me of something other than that being the first works because one, it's work. And two, it's like, I mean, this is what, what the, the focus of scripture is. I mean, you go through the whole New Testament. This is the focus is bringing the gospel out to other people. That is the primary focus. And that's what we need to make sure that we are not getting distracted from and that we have a zeal for. Now, um, when you go to a church that's very zealous for winning souls, it's obvious and it will have an impact. It will stand out. I remember, and I know, I, I think, you know, Faithful Word Baptist Church is a good example of this. I attended that church for, you know, seven years before, before starting this church. And even just from the people, you know, for me, that was normal because I never really had a lot of experience in other churches. And, and it's exactly what I wanted. I mean, I was out of church for a lot of different reasons, but you know, one of them was just trying to find someone who wasn't just totally, you know, a church that wasn't just totally hypocritical and just dead as a doornail. Even though I didn't fully understand what it was I was looking for, when I went to that church, I was like, this is what I've been looking for. Because not only are they preaching the word of God, they're living it. And that stands out. And when you have a people that are zealous for serving God, and zealous for, you know, they put the map up and we got a map up on the wall. So when we color in, hey, we're reaching all these people. This is our focus. This is the objective. It rubs off on you. You notice it for sure. You go into a church. Not only do you see the, you know, the figures in the bulletin or whatever, but you see the people who you get visitors. They're going in and trying to give them the gospel. It's time to go soul winning. Hey, we've got a big group. We got all these people getting up, getting ready and going out soul winning. I mean, to the point where people are actually moving their families because they want to make sure they go to church that's on fire to serve the Lord. And when you go and visit these churches, that's what you get. Now, the question is, does our church have that spirit? Imagine yourself being a visitor for the first time. Come in, it doesn't matter from where, local or not. And coming in, and you're saved, and you come and sit down, and you just want to see what the church is like, would you have the feeling that this church is all about soul winning? Now, I'm not talking about from the sermons. I'm talking about from the reality. If you wanted to come and say, hey, I can't go soul winning on this time. Is there any other time I could go? And everyone's just like, no, 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 sorry, can't go. And, you know, it's a shame, but, but I, I feel like I have to bring this up. There was a time when we had people visiting, and wanted to go out soul winning. And, you know, the lady wanted to go out soul winning and, and no, one, no one was able to go. On a regularly scheduled soul winning time, nobody went. It's a shame. It's a shame. It's a shame to not be able to take out a visitor. People who are visiting want to go soul winning. But no, I'm going to go shopping. I'm going to go take a nap. I'm going to go do whatever else. And here comes someone that wants, that's not, that, that wants to go out. So, hey, we came to visit your church. I heard you guys are a great soul winning church. We want to go out soul winning. Sorry. Figure out what's important to you. What do you have time for? Uh, you're in John chapter 21. Because getting caught up with the affairs of this world is also infectious. It's something that could lead, you know, kind of go through a church, especially when we've got a close-knit family, of getting away from, you know, it's there to help you. It's great when people want to serve the Lord. Hey, it's going to rub off and people are going to get on fire collectively. Let's have a zeal. But it also works the other way. John 21, look at verse number 2. 
The Bible reads, Then were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Cana and Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. So you've got Simon Peter, you've got Thomas, you've got Nathanael, you've got James and John and two other people. You've got about seven people there gathered together, right? The disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered in his ship immediately, and that night they, got, they caught nothing. This is after Jesus Christ's resurrection. Peter decides, you know what? I just want to go out fishing. I want to go back to the life that I had before Jesus came into my life and turned everything upside down, and then we were going out and doing all this work and reaching people with the gospel. You know what? I just feel like going fishing. I just want to go out fishing. And when you read the story, you find out he's naked in the boat. And that's not put in there by accident. He's naked. Naked is, you know, associated with, with being ashamed and having, you know, just, just, it's a shame. He's just off into the world. He's naked. And, you know, obviously he was among other men or whatever. But, but the Bible said, you know, he's out there, he's naked. And he just wanted to go off and, and go fishing. But Jesus told him, he said, hey, from henceforth, you're going to be a fisher of men. So from here forward, he's saying you're not going to be a fisherman anymore. He called him from doing his work of catching fish. And, do, and that was his business and that was his job. He says, know what? No, now I want you to catch men. Now I want you to serve me. Now I want you to work for me. And what does he do? I'm just going to go out and go fishing. And he gets rebuked for that. And you read all of John 21, and that's when Jesus asked him three times, Yo, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he asked him three times, do you love me? Now, obviously, I believe also that that's, you know, going back to him denying Christ three times. But at the same time, you know, he's asking, do you love me? Jesus Christ said, you know, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If, if he loved him, you know, he's going to be a fisher of men. If you're following Jesus, you're going to be a fisher of men. But he went off to then just go off fishing. And not only did he go off fishing, he got everyone else to go with him. He's the one that brought it up. He said, you know what? I want to go fishing. Who wants to come with me and just... just but Peter, it's a soul winning time. Yeah, I feel like going fishing instead. It's infectious. Because your flesh doesn't want you to go out and serve God. Your flesh isn't going to want you to go out soul winning this afternoon. If you want an excuse to not go out and serve God, there's plenty of them. Plenty of things. Oh, I didn't get a good night's sleep last night. Oh, I don't feel that good. Oh, I'm hungry. Oh, I have this. Oh, I've got things to do. Oh, my house is a mess. Oh, I've got to do... You know, all kinds of things that will keep you from going. And the more you come up with excuses, other people, so-and-so is not going because of this. I've got a similar thing going on, so I'm not going to go. And then it just spreads, and it's just infectious like that. Well, I'm like, that's why, one, it's important for you personally just to say, you know, this is my stand, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to make sure it happens, and I'm going to make sure that this is, uh, I'm going to do this no matter what. Because when you make that determination, you know what, that's also going to help influence other people. When, when you can become that rock and help other people out. And, and again, have that attitude of being able to help other people out. Now, um, we're almost done. Turn, if you would, to Luke 19. It's the last place I'll have you turn. I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians 3, 5 says, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Now, I'm doing my best to lead this church, but I'm far from perfect. And if I expect to get anything done merely through my own power, I'm either going to do it wrong or it's going to fail. I need to rely on the power of God to do something big. I have to. That's what I say here, you know, in 1 Corinthians 3, where, where I was just reading for you, you know, one man plants, another man waters, but God's going to give the increase. So if I want to do anything good as a leader, I have to be relying on God to give the increase in this church. 
And if I'm just going to be relying on my own skill and ability and, and you know, way that I could communicate, that's going to fail. I'm not going to do it right. I need God to help me to lead this church, but you're the same way. The same thing with you. We all have the will to choose whether or not we're going to allow God to use us to do something big. You have that choice. You could choose not to. And you could be saved and choose not to. You say, you know what? I don't want to yield myself to God to do something big with my life. You have that choice. But you have to ask yourself, are you limiting the plans that God has for your life? Because God wants you to do something big for him. God wants everybody to do something big for him. God wants you to be a, 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 a fruitful servant. Someone who's going to go out and do what he has planned for you to do. And it's going to be you that limits him, not him limiting you. No matter what's going on in your life, you are going to be the one limiting what God can use you to do. The amount of people that God has for you to reach. You know, the personal ministering that maybe only you can supply. There's people out there, I believe that you are the best person to reach. I had this faulty mentality for a long time when I was new to church. And, you know, again, I, I, the, the, the biggest influence on my, on my life was Faithful Ward Baptist Church. And at the time that I was going, it was much, much smaller. It was like this, you know, this size church. And I had the benefit of being able to go soul winning with Pastor Anderson because there was like no other men that were attending at that time. It was pretty much a bunch of ladies. So every time I went soul winning, I went with Pastor Anderson. And I remember learning soul winning and you know for a while i didn't say anything because uh, i was just learning which is normal i mean anyone who goes out soul winning first time you want to learn sure come out be a silent partner just listen kind of see how things are done and then when when you're you know a little bit more comfortable you feel like you can you could kind of do a, a you know a decent job of just getting through the gospel and, and showing someone else how to how to put their faith in christ you know it's not that difficult but you know everyone has a little bit different time frame uh, then you do that but with me i was thinking that well I never wanted to open up my mouth and start talking because I just felt like, well, he's so much better at it than I, and he was better at it than I was, but, but he's so much better at it, I don't want to screw up anyone's salvation, so I'm just never going to say anything. But that was not the right attitude to have because I do believe that there's people that God can use even though, you know, as long as I'm willing to, to allow myself to, to do the work, one, I'm never going to grow if I don't open my mouth and start doing it then I'm just always going to be relying on one other person to do the work instead of me actually doing it and then multiplying and growing and being able to do more myself and having you know, two people going out and talking is much better than just one person. Obviously, that's a, that's a real simple understanding that, that, it, that it, it may only make sense for me to do it. But also, there are people out there that are going to understand the way I explain things better than him. And it's just the way it is. I mean, if you listen to other preaching online, you're going to have your favorites. You're going to have people that you like more than others. You're going to have people that say things that make sense to you more than when someone else says it or whatever. And that's normal because there's different people react different to, to different personalities and whatever. So all that said to say, you know, there's people out there that God wants you to reach. And you will have the best opportunity to get them saved, to get to lead them to Christ better than me or better than someone else because God has appointed you to be the minister unto them, which in 1 Corinthians 3, I'll read it again in verse 5, he says, Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. As much as God wants everyone to be saved, he's appointed a minister to every man to hear the gospel. Everybody has someone through whom God wants them to believe. Now, God can make backup plans, you know, but if you are the first choice for a person to get saved, don't, you know, why are you going to let that slide by to maybe someone else? And what, I mean, with some people, what if there is no one else that's going to have the opportunity? There are some people in, in our life that are really closed off to just about everyone and only let a few people in and only will allow the time of day to even talk about something to a few people. You may be the only person that can do that. It's a big responsibility, but God has entrusted that responsibility to us. Now, not only are those, those, those situations where maybe there's only one person, but even just going out to random people you don't know at a door, you know, we always pray, I pray that God leads us, you know, every time we go out and start soul winning, and there have been times where I've been, you know, partnering with, with someone else in church. 
And I'm glad that they were the ones giving the gospel because all these other things, you know, the way that I would say is way different, but then that person ends up getting saved. And it's like, well, I mean, <laughs> my own wisdom isn't going to get this person saved. God probably knew and, and you know, will work things out to, you know, to where we don't even realize you know, we're being led, if we're being led by him, and, and he knows who, who's going to you know, be the, the best person. And that, that's why I, I wholeheartedly believe that. I believe that to be true. God has appointed us ministers by whom we believe, so don't let down those people who have you appointed as their minister. Luke chapter 19, like I said, the last place we'll look at this morning and we're done. Luke chapter 19, we'll start reading verse number 12. Verse number 12, the Bible reads, He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. And he saith unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury? And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you that unto every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. So in this parable, we see this is obviously talking about when Jesus Christ comes back with his kingdom. Right? He's using this illustration of, of a man who owned a property, and he's saying, hey, occupy until I come. He's saying, you know, I've given you all these talents. I've given you all this money, and you need to work for me until I come. And he said, some of the people that were in his land said, we don't want you to rule over us, you know. We don't have anything to do with you. But then others, his servants that, that he entrusted to, to do a job, you know, it, it says when he comes back, when he's come back with his kingdom, he's come back to, to reconcile with these people and say, okay, well, what have you guys done? One guy's like, well, you gave me his talent. I got 10 talents for you. I've been busy. I've been working for you. Here's what, here's what I did for you. Great. Be thou over 10 cities. He gives him a reward. Great. Thank you for working hard for me. You know, same thing, a guy over five. But then there's the one guy's like, you know what? I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything with it. So why didn't you at least give, you know, give it to the, to the money exchangers to get usury? You're like, well, you, you should have at least done the minimum just so that, that it's not just a big loss when I come back. And he's saying, he's like, you know what? We're going to take that away from you. Give it to this guy that had 10. Because he's going to be even more blessed because he did the hard work. And what we see here, and then, of course, the people that didn't want the ruler, you know, these are like the unsaved people. They're just like, yeah, just cast them out. Right? Destroy them. We receive rewards for the work that we do, for the, for the souls that we win, for the things that we do. God wants us. You know, we're his servants. He's bought us. He's paid for us. We are his, and he wants us to do work for him. He wants us to occupy until he comes. I like that phrase, occupy till I come. Occupy means keep busy, work. How do you occupy your time? What's important to you? There's many things you could do in this world. There's all kinds of things. You could occupy your time doing, you, you could occupy your time sleeping. 
You could occupy your time going to work and just earning money. You could occupy your time with all kinds of organizations and causes and clubs and sports and activities and whatever. You could occupy your time with all kinds of things, whatever you want to devote your time to. But are you going to let all of these other things take all of your time? Because that's not what God wants us to do is just occupy till I come. He's not just saying keep yourself busy with all the things of this world. Right. Now, I'm not saying that any of those one things I mentioned is inherently just a bad thing, right? Any form of entertainment is not inherently a bad thing, but, but how are you occupying? Are you going to have anything to show when God comes back? What are you going to present to God? Well, God says, okay, I gave you talent. I gave you ability. I gave you means. I gave you a church where people care about you to provoke you unto love and good works. I gave you a lot of things. What did you do with it? What did you do with it? That's what God's going to say, not me. I'm asking you this morning because I want you to think about God asking you that question. I want our church, which is a great church, I love this church, to not only be a strong family like we are, but to be a zealous church. Let's have a zeal to provoke one another unto love and to good works. And have a zeal to do something big. For I think God can do something big. I don't want to have just some you know, lame church that people just, you just show up, we could, we could hear some cool things out of the Bible and then we go home and that's it. That is not why this church is here at all. We're here to reach people. We're here to just exalt Jesus Christ and his gospel and to, and to help as many people as possible. But it, but it requires work. It requires work to do that. You have to be willing to put in the time and... and I'm going to do my best to help lead to, to do as much work as I humanly possibly can. And I want everyone to, to have that same spirit. And let's, let's have that spirit. So when people come and visit us, when people come around, hey, here's a church that's on fire. Here's a church that's got a zealous spirit to serve the Lord and, and, to, and to do some good works. And that's, that's actively going out and reaching people, getting people saved, getting people baptized, changing lives through the power of Jesus Christ. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for, um, for all the teaching that we can receive from your words, Lord. We, I thank you for putting in Revelation, uh, those chapters 2 and 3, those letters to the churches that, um, that we can use to compare ourselves to and to receive instruction and wisdom and, and help us to know um, the things that we need to be focused on and, and the things we need to, to stay away from, Lord, and I pray that you would please just help our church continue to grow together, to be strengthened. God, there's been so many attacks. There's been so many problems in so many people's lives, Lord. And uh, we need to be able to stand strong. And, and uh, we're gonna, we are going to stand firm. We're going we're gonna to stand firm on your word. Lord, strengthen us together. Help us to have a, a, a spirit that's in unison with one another, uh, that, is, that has a goal of, of serving you, that wants to be here and, and um, devote as much of ourselves as we can to serving you, dear Lords. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.